All right, well, here we go for the second part of this week's lecture. Um, this part, we're going to look at integrating curriculum and content strategies, and we're going to look particularly at number sense and, and fractional number sense. Uh, here's some of the things we're going to cover. Um, we'll talk a little bit about planning and things like that, although I know you've done this a lot previously. Um, and then we're going to finish by looking at fractions. Uh, about halfway through, we've got a video for you to follow from Professor Joe Bowler, and I really encourage you to look at that one. Uh, I know you all would religiously look at every uh, video I've prompted so far, um, but this one I think is one you, you might really enjoy and appreciate. So, um, what forms effective maths teaching for students? How can you plan for it? Uh, the first thing is you need to plan with the concepts in mind. And if you think back to what we talked about in the first lecture of this week, that's not the skills per se, it's about the concepts. What we want kids to develop is mathematical conceptual understanding. And the skills are associated with that conceptual understanding. But the key starting point is the concept. We want kids to develop robust, strong, mathematical conceptual understanding, not just knowledge. Uh, and again, You've done lots of work on uh, planning before. What do you start with? What's the nature of the content? And particularly the concepts that's appropriate for these students. And when we say appropriate for these students, we mean not just what the curriculum says a year three student should do, but what are they actually bringing to the classroom? Um, if you're gonna do grouping, how should you group them? By ability or mixed, mixed up or just pairs or threes, all those sorts of things. What are some of the effective pedagogical techniques? And again, we've talked about learning theories in the first half of this week's lectures, um, which helps you understand the best way to structure it. And then what are the different types of maths lesson you might choose? Do you want to have a guided inquiry lesson? This is particularly useful when you're trying to con uh, look at a new concept, something that they haven't particularly seen before, uh, at least in the way you're approaching it at this time. Do you want it to be corroborative learning or do you want it to be individual learning? Is it going to be direct instruction or is it going to be a more discovery approach? Right, so dis direct instruction is often useful when you want them to review something or to reinforce old content. But sometimes when you're teaching a new thing, you might use direct instruction as well. You need to make these judgment calls based on your professionalism and what you know of the learners in front of you. So planning and delivering teaching for students. Now you notice there we're not, we didn't say planning and delivering teaching for teachers. We're always starting with the students and the learners in front of us. And, and although this is an obvious thing, often we get so captured with our teaching that we forget the purpose of our teaching is that students are learning something. So how can you plan with the con concepts in, mo in, uh, in mind? Here's a sequence, and again, you won't always follow this. Here's some ideas uh, that work sometimes. Use it as a guide, not as a, a, something you have to follow strictly. So first thing, I always look at what are some of the difficulties they might have with the language. Uh, how many new terms am I going to introduce in each lesson or each experience they have? And try and limit it to just one or two new terms if necessary. Um, are some of those terms got meanings that they might have from other places? So there might be a term uh, that you're going to introduce that they've used either in common language or elsewhere. And when you come to the lesson, it means actually something quite particular. So, for example, um, a half. In mathematics, a half means something quite specific. <clears throat> it means when something's been split into two equal parts, or oh, there are other conceptions, and they're both the same size, two equal parts. Whereas in common language, a half just means something that's been chopped into two parts and they're not necessarily the same size. So that's some of the language things and conceptual things you might need to think about. But if you need to, make sure you introduce one thing at a time and how can you help them understand it, get conceptual understanding that the language related to the concept. What, what are some of the gaps they might have in their previous knowledge? Now sometimes, particularly as you get to the upper levels of primary school, you'll have some kids who've got big gaps. They might have been away sick for a while or they might have missed some important part. And the problem we often get with this is kids say, oh, 
I'm hopeless at maths, I missed out on something when I was in grade four and I've never caught up. Now this is a, a real shame because these kids just give up completely. And so your job as a teacher is to say, okay, you might have missed something particular, I can teach you that really quickly and help you move on from where we're at. I'm not gonna teach you everything from grade three or four or five and so we can go on to year six. I'm just gonna tell you, teach you just in time what you need to learn to do, to do the next bit. So a kid might have missed the, the stuff on fractions in grade four or five, for example, and then you'd come to do probability in grade six and the kid says, I can't do it, I don't know fractions. So then you just have a little mini lesson to help them catch up there. I call that just in time learning. Don't teach it to them three weeks before, teach them just before they need to know it to use it in the next thing. Um, the third part then is once you've worked with the language and the new concepts, you've understood why the gaps are in their prior knowledge possibly, then you need to look at um, where they might use it to solve different problems. Give them lots of examples, lots of different things where they need to apply it and uh, use it to do a problem solving task of something that's meaningful for them. And then the last thing is try and provide some really sensory rich um, opportunities for kids to remember things. And now you can use mnemonics, I'm not always a big fan of them because sometimes they remember the mnemonics but they don't understand what it means. So those of you who did um, Secondary school might have remembered uh, doing soccer tower, and that's trigonometry. But no one has any idea about what trigonometry is, they just think it's soccer tower. And really soccer tower is just um, an acronym to remember the three um, basic trig ratios. So that's not really learning mathematics. What I want them to do is learn and understand the concepts, and then maybe I'll set, teach them a mnemonic to help them to remember it. So one you might use in primary school is uh, BODMAS or BOMDAS or to do order of operations. Uh, it is good to remember things, but it's important to remember things actually, but it only comes after you understand what you're doing. So don't teach them some random thing to memorize and then think that they'll learn the concept after. It doesn't happen that way. They need to understand the conceptual things first. All right, some, some, some lesson specific planning. If you're doing grouping, there's two options you can do. You can do cooperative learning uh, and this is where you have small groups. Now there's a lot of research around cooperative learning and um, how useful it can be in helping students solve problems. Um, the preference usually is for small groups, I would suggest usually no more than three, um, that they have a common task and they all work on it together. Now we won't give you an exhaustive list here, I'm, I'm pretty confident you would have looked at some of this before. There's times when they give kids different roles, kids do different things, but the point is you have to teach them how to work together. You can't just lump them in a group and assume that they'll know what to do. So if you're gonna do cooperative learning and learning in small groups throughout the year, which I hope you will do, one of the first things you'll need to do is help them to learn to work together. Teach them some of those cooperative skills. How can they listen to one another? How can they encourage everyone to be involved? Because otherwise what you'll often find is there'll be one kid who'll do all the work and the other two will sit there and um, at the end they'll just let the one person do it. So that's not cooperative learning. But it can be a really powerful way of doing mathematics. The second thing is using things like peer tutoring. Now there's a lot more than this, but peer tutoring I find is really useful. Um, dyadic just means you have two people together. And what happens is you might have one student uh, teaching the other student how to do it. There's lots of ways you could do it. You might have two sorts of problems. You give one student one problem and the other one the other problem preferably something they can do, not something um, new and novel to them. And then once they've learned it, they then teach their peer how to do it. Uh, another thing can be if a student's away one lesson, then they come back the next lesson, get one of the other students to teach them. Now, now this just isn't using students as scab labor to uh, fill in for you. What it means is if a student has to explain it to someone else, then they have to understand it themselves. So it's a really useful way to build conceptual uh, knowledge and understanding, deep learning in the person who is doing the tutoring as well as the learner. The, the other advantage of it can be is often when we uh, do something in class, we explain something to students and then the students say, I don't understand. And then as teachers, all we do is we do exactly the same explanation we did before. Now this doesn't help them any more to understand than what the first time did. So if you get someone else to explain it, they might highlight it a different way. And particularly students who understand each other, they might use slightly different language or different ways of talking about it, which might help them. 
So, th so there's a couple of approaches among many that you could possibly try. Now, one of the things I'm sure you hear about is number sense. And uh, one of the things we want to build in through the mathematics program is number sense, not just number knowledge, not even just conception knowledge, but a, an awareness and an understanding of it. NCTM is the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics in the United States, and it's a very powerful body in terms of curriculum and mathematics education, how it's uh, understood and developed. So they said, number sense is an intuition about numbers that is drawn from all varied meanings of number. So that seems a bit broad, broad but you see there it's that intu intuition about numbers. Right, so not something formal, not algorithms per se, but an intuition. It doesn't equal number facts. So how can you develop some key competencies in number sense? Kids who uh, have a good number sense have good number sense will might do things like they'll understand that numbers are representations of objects, but they're also representations of magnitudes or relationships and other attributes. Okay, so when we use numbers, uh, when we use the number th three, for example, it represents three objects in a set. But when we use a three in measurement, it represents a length or, or, or something else, or a mass or something. But it's not, there's not three things there, it's just a distance. And so that's not the same thing. So kids who have number sense will have an understanding that three can be used in all, lots of different ways or, or any other number you like to choose. They also understand that numbers can be operated on, compared, used, communicated with. They're not just uh, a representation of some specific thing, but they can be played with if you like. Uh, the, th the third part they might have if they have good competency in number sense is they understand that mathematics and number, with all the rules and operations, is about having an intuitive sense of that mathematics can be used in lots of ways to solve problems. So there's not just a sense you learn this stuff for the sake of learning it. You can use it in lots of different ways uh, and in flexible ways. So they might understand that things like, and we'll, we'll approach this in a minute, that uh, 15 times 7 is the same as 10 times 7 plus 5 times 7. They can split numbers up, they can put them back together, they can rearrange them in meaningful ways. And they also have a sense of the understanding of the size of things. Particularly if you give a big number, that, um, you know, they just don't, if you said 500, they don't just think it's big, they have an idea of what that might be. So some of the problems we get in this is, um, and things that hinder it as a teacher we can do, is if we splinter maths into simplified content and algorithm memorization. So when even when you're doing the basic number operations, we might do addition, then we do subtraction. But those two things are, are intimately interrelated. If you know that five, uh, five and two is seven, you also know that seven take away two is five and seven take away five is two. Do they learn these things together? Or do we teach them in a simplified, disconnected way? Do we get them to get an idea of when they join things through an algorithm, so 57 add 25, do they know that that's roughly 60 plus 25, so about, it'll be about 85, and then we've gone added three on, so we'll take three off, so it'll be 82. Or do they only understand an algorithm, right, 57 plus 25, write the numbers down under each other, do the addition, you know, carry over, blah, blah, blah. It's much more than having the algorithm. They, they should have a sense of what the, uh, you can do with them and what the answer might be. So make sure you're developing that richness first. Um, often we can uh, hinder students' development of number sense by emphasizing practice without understanding the strategies. And kids who do this, for example, will know two, two and two, but they wouldn't be able to work out that sort of helps you do two and three. A bit like the example we said before. So always in your teaching, helping kids explore numbers, play with numbers, see what they can do. What does it help you do? What, you know, and, and I'm sure if you've been on prac, you might have heard them talking about, you know, near to tens or happy numbers and all those sorts of things. They're just ways of helping develop number sense. And there'll be lots of programs that do it that you may see on practicum and you may see when you start your teaching career. But it's really important that we help the kids develop um, their number sense 
not just their knowledge and skills in uh, doing algorithms. So what are the four parts that really make up number sense? Now, I'm giving you four. There could be five, there could be three, it doesn't really matter. But some of the key things you need to really work on with kids is their mental mathematics. Uh, and this is something we, I think we don't do enough of. Um, mental is, is stuff they can do in their head. And I think we underestimate what students can do in their heads. Um, back in the old days, we used to do mental maths and then we'd do pencil and paper maths and then we'd do it on a calculator if it was hard. Nowadays, we don't really need pencil and paper very much because we've always got a calculator. And some people say, oh, what if you haven't got a calculator? Well, even most kids these days have got a calculator with them all the time because they've always got their phone. Um, but anyway, mental maths is more important, in my opinion, than it used to be. So if you gave <coughs> students an, a question like uh, 76 times 48, it doesn't really matter if they can't do 76 times 48 in their head per se, but I wanted them to know it's about 80 times 50, so that should be about 4,000. That's To me, that's important. And then if they need to, they could do it on their calculator, and if they make an error pressing a button or something and they got uh, a number that's radically different from 4,000, then they go, hang on a sec, that doesn't look right. But helping kids do things mentally is important. And I would be encouraging my kids all the time to do things. On, you know, so I'd say to them, here's, here's a question we're working on. What do you think the answer is first? Could you work it out? Okay, now check it and see what you think. Rather than just helping them to go automatically to an algorithm or their calculator and things like that. The, the th second thing that's really important is estimation. And again, in my opinion, this is something we really underestimate and undervalue in the curriculum. Kids being able to estimate things. And, and the reason we often uh, undervalue it is it's something we don't test very easily. If you want to see how good kids' estimation is or sense about some of these things, uh, ask them how tall they think you are. And, and they'll give you number, anything from, from seven metres to, to um, two metres or something like that, which shows they have no idea about the estimation of length or no number sense about measurement. So helping kids estimate. Help them to estimate, like the example we just gave before, before they then calculate. And then do you re when you need to know the exact answer, then you can calculate it either using an algorithm or a calculator if necessary. Um, having a sense of number meaning is important, what numbers mean and represent, and then finally language. We've talked about language before as well. I'm just going to do a little bit about estimation, and these are just some strategies. I don't think necessarily any of them are great or, or bad, but there's some things you might need to uh, consider and use when you're teaching your class. So I'll put them up in here. Uh, I don't talk about them too much now, but you can go back and visit them. So one way of doing estimation, trying to help to develop the kids' uh, capacity to do estimation, is called front-end estimation. Uh, and there's an example there. If you gave the kids 421 plus 790 plus 233, all they say is just take the front-end digits, the first digit in each of these cases, 4, 7, and 2, and you get 13, so therefore you've got a rough idea of what the answer would be. Um, now you can hopefully see some uh, really big flaws with this approach, um, and what modifications like might you do. So one of the flaws that I've seen happen a lot, well the first one is obviously the answer is always going to be <coughs> pardon me, too low, because 790, you'd be better off to round that to 800 than 700. But the other one is if, if the question was 421 plus 790 plus 23, kids still take the first, um, the front end one and add them together and we'll get a similar answer. So that they, they can miss the fact that the, the, in this case they're all three digit numbers. So how might you modify this to help kids estimate? It might be a useful technique, it's one I've seen a little bit of, I don't think it's a great one myself. Um, here's another one called compatible numbers. Um, so if you've got to do uh, 24 times 8, that's quite complicated for a student in year 3 or something like that. But they might uh, make it 24 times 20, or they might make it 25 times 8 or something like that. So finding compatible numbers. Um, 
this is quite useful for kids and it's something that's been emphasised quite a lot through various programs that have been used in primary schools. And, and I think it's a useful way to develop kids' number sense uh, and estimating answers before they may or may not need to necessarily find the exact answer. Uh, flexible rounding, all these titles uh, might be useful. I, I don't know where they've come from, but you can see in this case here, if you've got something like 28 plus 24, you can make, say 28 is around 30 and 24 is around 25, so then it's more like 30 and 25. Now the important thing here is when you work that out, you want the kids to then, in a, in a case like this, I would think they might use flexible rounding, but in the end I'd want the kids to be able to do this in their head anyway. I, I wouldn't want my kids reaching for their calculator when they get 28 plus 24 or doing the written algorithm. But they might say, oh look, that's 30 plus 25, which is um, 55, and then, okay, I've added two on, and I've added one on, so I need to take three off to get the exact answer. Um, there's a couple of ways of doing it, as you can see there. And the other one's clustering. This is not particularly useful because it only works really when all the numbers are close together. But it's there for you if you want to have a look at it. So, developing number sense, you may have seen uh, you, some of your teachers in your classes talk about number talks or number talk. Uh, it's not mathematics per se, it's a way of just having these uh, kids talk about numbers in a meaningful way and part of their school uh, program. Uh, often done, not in, sometimes done in maths program, but sometimes just done in general time uh, around the start of the day on the mat or something like that. And here is the link to the video that I hope you look at. Professor Jo Bowler is one of the world leaders uh, in mathematics education and she's highly regarded uh, across the world. And, and she talks about it here and gives you some example. Now, hopefully you've looked at the video now or, or if you're not going to look at it later, but it just shows you the different ways that people solve problems and why number sense is important. So the first person on the video uh, to do 18 times 5, he said, well, 18 is 9 and 9, and you multiply that by 5, which gives you 45, plus 45, which is 90. The second person did for 18 times 5, said half of 18 is 9, and double 5 is 10, so that's 9 times 10, which is 90. The third student uh, in the video said, well, 18 times 5, 18 becomes 10 plus 8, so 10 times 5 is 50, 8 times 5 5 is uh, 40, add them together you get 90. And then the last one said 18 times 5, round 18 up to 20, multiply by 5, and then you subtract the two lots of 5 and you get 90. And the point of showing you this here is you can see all of them use number sense, but all four of them use different ways of solving it. Now sometimes in class what we do is we tend to emphasise algorithms and one way of doing it well, in fact, all four of these are legitimate ways of doing the, uh, finding the solution. And so what's more important is the, kit, the uh, students here have an, a number sense and a way of playing and manipulating numbers rather than just knowing an algorithm to do it. I, I encourage you to look at the video and see what you think. Um, I'm just going to go a little bit onto fractions here. Again, you would have done fractions in Maths 1 and Maths 2, but often uh, fractions are one of the areas that pre-service teachers find really difficult to teach or are a bit anxious about, and also students sometimes find difficult to learn. So what do the students need to do to understand fractions and develop a number sense in, with fractions? Um, what would they, first of all, they need to understand that the operations with numbers, what they mean. So do you not understand that adding means joining together? It doesn't ever mean anything else. Addition is always about joining two things together. But subtraction could be one of three things actually, which you would have done in Maths 1, I think. It can be a takeaway. All right, I've got 18 lollies. Uh, I eat six, how many have I got left? That's a takeaway. Or it could be you're finding the difference. Um, I've got 18 lollies, you've got 12. How many more have I got than you? Or in fact, there's a third one. It could be, um, I've got 12 lollies. How many more do I need to get to 18? They're all different sorts of a subtraction sums. But students need to understand those before they can do um, operations with fractions. 
and that's having a sense of the operation as well as a sense of fractions. I think to understand multiplication is just repeated addition and division is sharing or repeated subtraction. So it's important that we give students lots of chance to develop fraction sen number sense with fractions as well as whole numbers. And like we talked about with the example just before, having this number sense with fractions is probably more important than being able to do the algorithms with them. To be honest, now we have the decimal system, we really do much uh, operations with fractions in just everyday life. So to develop some sort of fraction sense, you would begin with simple contextual tasks and help them develop uh, their own methods of computing things and calculating things with fractions. Now, almost every class I've been does it with a pizza or a cake or something like that. You just need to find contexts that are simple and relate to what the kid's actually doing and understand. Uh, be careful that your models are correct. Uh, so if you have a pizza, for example, and you chop it into eight, which is pretty standard, um, they're not the same size. So don't help, be careful that you're not teaching the students that an eighth is just things cut into eight. They have to be the same size to be an eighth. So you can see that some of the things that uh, might emerge from those sorts of things. And it's the same if you use a cake or something like that. Also, um, I saw one person had a cake and they wanted to chop it up for the class to help the students learn about numbers. Uh, and they had, I don't know, let's say 20 students in the class. The problem is by the time they cut up the cake into 20 pieces, it was just mostly crumbs and a mess on the table. So it, the model didn't help them develop a conceptual understanding. Uh, the second thing is help them develop their fractional computational number sense based on what they've already done with whole number computational number sense. So if they've learned to round, maybe you could help them round again with fractions, uh, things like that. Use estimation and informal measurements to try and get them an idea of fractions, how big they are, what does it mean? Because remember when they come to school, something like a half will normally mean either something to do with a clock or a period of play in a sports game. Um, explore lots of operations with different models. Uh, again, there's a link there for you to follow. What do you think of the video? What are your positives of it? What are your negatives about it? There's lot, to be honest, there's lots of these on the internet and um, you can give them to students to look at it, particularly if they've missed something or to follow up or to reinforce something. But just be aware that some of them actually can make the students learning worse rather than better. So I've just put that one up as an example that you can find commonly on the internet. Final point. These are just ideas, they're not recipes to be followed directly. I don't know if I've said this before, but in the end, you have to work out what works best for you and your learners in your school site. And as I've mentioned many times, I'm sure, we're confident that you can do this because you're gonna be professional in the way you approach it. You, can't, you won't leave here with the recipe of how to do maths teaching at any year level, but you will go with a kit bag of, kit bag of resources and ideas that will help you make good professional judgments. Okay, hope you enjoyed it, hope it was useful, hope you feel challenged about your teaching. Um, we're really uh, excited about you heading out into schools in the coming years and what you'll do with our kids. Um, so all the best, see you next week.